We're doing a series entitled The Journeys of Abraham. And this morning we're going to be looking at, it's not a long journey, but it's a hard journey. And that is the journey of peace. Our text this morning is found in Genesis chapter 13, and we're just going to read verses 5 through 9. And it says, Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you. Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. The most common place that we find conflict is in families. Families sometimes disintegrate because of conflict. I know my father's family upon the death of my grandfather basically disintegrated my grandfather had by his own words a bad will and when he was in the hospital with a sickness unfortunately that he ended up dying with and different members of the family were staying with him. And my dad was staying with him one night. And my grandfather said to my father, Alfred, I've got a bad will. And if I get out of here, I want to change it. Unfortunately, he never got out of the hospital alive. He ended up dying about two weeks later. When the family met after the funeral... My dad felt compelled to tell his mother and his brothers and sisters what my grandfather had said. Some of them wanted to go by my, what my grandfather had said to my father. Others said, no, what's written is what's written. And the family ended up basically disintegrating. Families come into conflict over stuff and over other things. Sometimes it's power struggles. Sometimes it's a feeling that I've been done wrong. But... It takes a great effort to focus on this journey that we're calling peace. And Abram makes that journey. I've put there at the top of your lesson what's commonly known as the golden rule. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. In other words, treat people the way that you want to be treated. And it's amazing how few people, such a simple rule, it's amazing how few people actually follow that rule. If they do, I figure they must, some people want to be treated by being yelled at all the time. They want to be treated by being put down all the time because that's the way they treat those that are around them. The problem is very simple here in this story. The land is not big enough. 
Lot and Abram have grown significantly. They had gone through, as we looked at in the last chapter, they had gone through a period of famine. But in staying in, instead of staying in the land of Canaan, they decided to go to Egypt. And when they went to Egypt, everything economically worked well for them. They prospered. Their flocks got bigger. Everything increased that they had. And so they've moved back to the land of Canaan. And now they're finding a problem because only so many cattle or so many sheep or so many goats can exist on an acre of land. And you can't overcrowd it and only so many animals can get to a water hole. And so there's a problem here because there's just a not enough resources to supply all of them. And what ends up is that the servants are fighting with each other. It's amazing how this is our water hole. We were planning on coming here. Well, we got here first. Tough luck. Well, no, you've got to leave. You know. Well, we're the servants of Abram. We don't care. We're the servants of Lot. You know, you get into these competing groups, and everyone is at each other's throat, and there's a problem here. And that's where Abram, who would later become Abraham, decides to deal with the problem. Now, what's amazing here is that he doesn't deal with the problem the way that a lot of us deal with family problems. Most of us spend most of our time when we're dealing with family problems and family conflicts trying to figure out whose fault it is. As if there's something magical about being able to say to the other person or the other party, we're right and you're wrong. In fact, most fights in families are about that same subject. I'm right. No, you're not. I'm right. And we spend all of our time focusing on who's wrong so that we can have someone to blame and so we can justify ourselves instead of focusing on the problem. Now the Bible doesn't tell us in the story, but it's very clear on who's really wrong in this situation. The person that's wrong is Abram. Abram had, in the previous chapter, decided not to stay in Canaan and went to Egypt instead, where, as I said, he prospered. The problem was God wanted, had told him, here is the land I want you to stay in. Here's the land I'm going to bless you in. But when things got bad, Abram decided, nope, I'm not going to be here where God wants me to be. I'm going to go where I think I can do okay. And they did grow. And as we see here, they grew so much <coughs> that they can no longer stay together. And so the family is splitting up. Basically, if you took it back to a decision that Abram had made earlier, and now he's reaping the consequences of it. What's interesting is he's not focusing on that. What we see here are two overriding principles that Abram has. And I would say that these are the principles that we have got to have if we're ever going to take this journey of peace. And the first principle is this. Peace is better than conflict. Now, this isn't a firm and fast rule, and if you wait till next week, we'll find out that sometimes conflict is unavoidable. But most of the time, conflict is avoidable, especially conflict within a family. And Abram has decided something has to be done. And so he chooses 
his goal, if you notice here, his goal is not to be right. His goal is not to get what he thinks he deserves. His goal is peace. And if you're going to take this journey, sometimes you have to ask yourself this question, what is my goal? Is it one of peace? Abram decided, I want peace. And I will live with the consequences if I have peace. I know in a personal experience, I've seen this in the church world. I remember years ago, we had gone through uh, some issues with a praise team. And I'd gone through a whole summer with them bickering back and forth with each other. And it wasn't where I could figure out, okay, it's always this person's involved. So there was never one troublemaker, you would say, who's creating the problem. It's just among the whole group. And then the leader resigned and they left. And I remember meeting with the group, trying to figure out, okay, because I was concerned about them. And I remember my goal is I wanted to somehow bring them together and unify them. And so I brought them together and I had a meeting with them. And I, I remember telling them, okay, what are our options now? Because our leader has left and we've got to figure out what we're going to do, who's going to take over, how we're going to do things. Because among other things, we had lost, with losing the leader, we lost one of the major mu musicians and it was trying to figure out what in the world? And so we talked about different ideas, and I told them, okay, you go home, think about it, pray about it, and we're going to come back a week from now, and we're going to try and figure out what it is that we can decide on. And I remember I had seven options in my mind, and I, rem and I remember thinking, okay, uh, this one's better than that one, and so on and so forth. But I wasn't going to put my two cents into the situation because I had decided I want unity and if I get unity I'm going to live with unity and I remember they came back and they chose what I thought was the worst decision but they were all agreed on it and in my mind I thought this isn't going to work but I got unity so I'm going to take unity, and then I'm going to give it, you know, a couple of months, and then they're going to come to me and say, Pastor, this isn't going to work. Save us. And I thought, I'm ready. I know what I'm going to tell them. But I'll never forget the first Sunday after they decided what they were going to do, and they were unified. And I remember sitting there during the service, listening to the music, watching the crowd, and the thought hit me all of a sudden. My God, this is going to work. They don't need me to rescue them. God is blessing what they're doing. Why? Because they were united. And the way you get united is you have to be at peace with one another. Because if you're not at peace with somebody, you can't be joined with them. And it's amazing how that principle of unity and that principle of peace. But we have to make that decision as Abram does here. And that is peace is better than conflict. And the things that I have to do in order to get to peace, I'm willing to do. That was his attitude. His second attitude, and this is where it really grates on some of us, and that was the principle that Abram had was, I am willing to live with second best. Now that is hard for some of us. Because we've been told all of our lives... You deserve the best. 
you want the best. But notice what Abram does here. He goes out there, and we can see the situation where he's saying, look, you choose the left, and I'll go to the right. You choose the right, and I'll go to the left. So the implication here is they're obviously on some kind of hill where they can look around, and they can see the land, and basically on one side the land is flat land, and down there by the river, and everything is well watered, and the grass grows better, and uh, the water is more plentiful down there, and the other land tends to be more hilly, and not as much, the grass doesn't grow as good, and the water isn't as plentiful, and things just aren't as good in this area, and yet Abram is willing to live with second best. Why? Because of the first principle. You see, when you choose peace, you're saying peace with the second best area is better than conflict in the best area. It's sort of like how one of the things I've learned over the years in, in counseling married couples is most of the arguments are over, are over what I call great ideas. Now, here's how I define a great idea. A great idea is when you agree with me. When Sheila agrees with me, I think she's smart. When the kids agree with me, I think they're brilliant. The problem is they don't often see the greatness and the brilliance of my ideas. Even after living a lifetime with me, they haven't been convinced. You know, I, sometimes I top it up where they're slow learners and, you know, there are all these issues that are going on. And the problem that most married couples get into is they're arguing over two great ideas. One says, this is what I think is best, and the other one says, no, th this is what I think is the best. But you know, when you go back and you look, one of the founding principles of marriage is not to have great ideas. I know that comes as a shock to some of us. But the goal of marriage, and, it, and the Bible states simply that God... You know, when you look at the principles of marriage in the Bible, they're very few because they're very simple and they're very few because you only need a few principles to make things work. And the number one goal of marriage is not to have great ideas. The number one goal of marriage is not to do all these other things that we think of. The number one goal of marriage is unity. You can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and God said... My will is the two shall become one. And of course the argument usually is over which one. Because we think, oh, this is my idea. This is what I think is best. And that's where sometimes in a marriage we have to sacrifice a great idea for a good idea. Now, I told you how to define a great idea. A great idea is when you agree with me. A good idea is this. A good idea is one that both of us can live with. Because a great idea sometimes does not produce unity, but sometimes a good idea will bring us together in agreement. And I find that that's what God is going to bless. Well, sometimes, though, if you're not choosing your great idea or the best solution... That means that you have to learn how to live with second best. This is it the best. I still think my idea was the best. But in order to have peace, in order to have unity, I'm willing to live with second best. That's Abram's principle. He's just going out on the day in which he meets with Lot, and he's saying... I have one goal. The conflict is going to stop. 
And whatever price I have to pay in order to get that, then I'm willing to pay it. Now, let's look at Lot's choice for a moment. We're looking at Lot's choice because, and if you go on and you read this chapter, it says that Lot looked and he looked and he looked toward the plain and he saw that it was well watered and it reminded him of a place. It reminded him of Egypt. Well, how does he know what Egypt looks like? Because his uncle took him there. So again, we see the continuing consequences of making bad mistakes. A lot of times when we make bad mistakes in judgment and we're not obeying God, it's not us that pays the most, but it's our loved ones that pay the most for our wrong decisions. In this case, Lot looked and he said, it looks a lot like Egypt. I think I want to go there. And so he says, I will take the more prosperous land. But then it goes on and it says that there was something bad about this particular area because Sodom and Gomorrah were there. And so he says, basically, I will ignore the moral conditions that I'm putting my family and my servants in. And you see, sometimes we need to understand and that when we make these choices, we need to take everything into account. And Lot doesn't do that. Lot says, I will take I will take this area because it's more prosperous, but he's willing to ignore the moral conditions that he's going to put his family in, and he's going to pay a heavy price for that. We don't know if it would have been different if he had taken the other area and Abram had to go into this area. We don't know how Abram would have dealt with it. We can only assume that because he's wiser and more mature and more a person of faith that Abram would handle it better, but we don't know. We just know the choices that Lot made. And you never know the outcome of things on how they're going to do. That's why you have to make the choices based on what feels good to you. But we need to understand that just making the more prosperous choice is not always the best thing to do. It's not always the right way for us. And that gets us into this whole, when we look at the journey of Abraham and why do we look at his journeys? Because primarily they're journeys of faith. And this right here, I would maintain, this journey of peace is an incredible journey of faith because basically he's saying, I will take second best, I will have peace because I believe that God has promised me that he was going to bless me. And Abraham has said, I'm willing to live with the blessing of God even if I have the second best choice. That's faith. Faith says, I'm trusting God because I believe God wants me to live at peace. I believe God wants me to live in unity. And I believe that the price that I pay for that is going to be more than compensated by the blessing of God. Now what's interesting here is God doesn't speak until everything is over. Lot has made his choice and he moves on to his area. Abram has lived with that choice and told his servants okay everybody pack up and they were probably thinking you mean we're leaving the best water holes and Abram said yeah we are and no doubt someone said but that's not fair a 
common refrain I heard from my children as they were growing up. Dad, it's not fair. To which I always responded, when did I ever promise you fair? Never made that promise. I promised I would try to be good with you, but I never promised I'd be fair. Because you'll never meet any standard of fairness in this world. But you can always meet a standard of good. So Abram told his servants, okay, let's start moving. This is the area that we're going to. And they probably complained and grumbled about it until they got to the first water hole where they didn't have a fight. And you know, it's amazing how when you do something and you find a place when you've lived in conflict for a long time and all of a sudden you find yourself without conflict. And it's like, wow. So this is what it feels like. So Abram has made his choice and he's moved his men and his flocks and they've all gone into that area that's less prosperous and it's not as well watered and it doesn't have as much grass and it means they're going to have to work a little bit harder. And Lot has made his choice and he's moved his people and his flocks and they're down there in their separate places. And then God speaks. And it's interesting, God's response. Because unlike Abram and unlike Lot, God knows what's going to happen. And he knows that Lot has made for him and his family basically a bad choice. And he knows that Lot's going to lose basically everything that he has. So Abram, one of the first things that he does when he moves to this new land and this new area is he builds an altar and he calls on the name of the Lord. And when he calls on the name of the Lord, God's response is, I want you to look around. You know, it's interesting, this is a contrast because Abram had said to Lot, you go to the right and I go to the left, you go to the right, you go to the left and I go to the right. And so basically they're dividing it up. But then when God gets Abram by himself and he's there in his particular area, God tells Abram, Abram, I want you to look to the north, I want you to look to the south, I want you to look to the east, and I want you to look to the west. And he says, I will give you all the land. This is God's blessing on the choices of Abram. And you see, sometimes we think that when we do this, when we choose the way of peace, when we choose the way of unity, we think, well, I'm really giving up something. And what God's trying to tell us is, no, you're not. Because my blessing is going to more than compensate what you think that you have given up. That's why it's worth this journey. That's why it's worth the effort. That's why it's so important for us to have principles in our life. And a principle of peace instead of conflict is worth the effort. Because what do we get from it? Basically, we're getting God saying, you've made a good choice. I'm going to bless you. The world may look at you and think, oh, well, you're just, you made a bad choice. You got the worst end of the bargain. But God says, I'm going to bless you where you're at. I will bless you. And my contention and what I think Abraham Ham learned through all of his various journeys is that when you choose God and you choose his blessing it's worth far more than all the choices of this world and so God says to Abram I'm going to bless you I will give you 
all the land. That is the promise that I give you. As I said earlier in the beginning, I've lived through a family that has disintegrated. I know what that feels like. It's not good. You never recover from it because choices have been made, lines have been drawn, and nobody is willing to pay the price. On the other hand, I've lived in a family, a family that my father learned from my, his parents' mistakes, and we were raised differently. We did things differently. And I've seen the advantages of choosing God's way, of choosing to do it God's way instead of my way. Like I said, remember what my way is. My way is great. But sometimes good is better than great. What makes good better than great? The blessing of God. You can never, ever overestimate that. Ask yourself this. How much is the blessing of God worth in my life? I would contend it's worth a lot. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the people that are here. Thank you for your word, Lord, that teaches us so many powerful things. God, I just want to pray for each family that's represented here. Lord, there may be some of us that are dealing with conflict. There may be some of us that are dealing with situations. Lord, I just pray that we would be open to your leading and your guiding, Father. And that we would understand that peace and unity is preferable to conflict. Lord, I just pray that your blessing would be upon each one of us here today. And Father, we pray and we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's all stand. Allow you to text questions in during the service. And our first question this morning, isn't conflict a good thing? It allows growth and allows trust in God. Yes. We need to understand, though, the difference between good conflict and bad conflict. Not all conflict is bad. And we'll get into this more as we continue this next week. But let me give you the definitions here. Bad conflict is about people. Good conflict is about ideas. As you know, they have the two championship games today and unfortunately Denver is not in them and Steve Pittsburgh isn't either our condolences to you but you know the four teams that were involved no doubt there was a certain level of conflict as they were trying to figure out what is the best way to beat the other team and I just hope Jacksonville has a really good plan myself personally and amen but anyway, conflict, good conflict is about ideas. Bad conflict is about persons. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, bad conflict is when I say to you, if you pose an idea, that is the dumbest idea I ever heard of. That's sort of the, sort of the example of bad conflict. Good conflict is, I don't think that idea is going to work, and here's why. Our second question. Why was it so wrong for Abram to move somewhere that prospered his family? Ah, because God had given him a specific place and said, here's where I want to bless you. And Abram said, I don't like what's happening here, so I'm going to move. 
Well, when he moved, whatever faith he had, he lost, as we talked about last week, because he said he couldn't trust God with anything. He couldn't trust God about his wife. He told her, look, they might like you, and they might want to kill me to get you, even though God said, I'm going to bless you. And he said, uh, he wasn't, didn't have enough faith to even trust God on that. So he told Sarai to say, tell everybody you're my sister, not my wife. So... Sometimes God tells us and ties us, as he did to Abram, this is the place I want you, in good times and bad times. It's amazing how many marriages disintegrate. We say those vows, basically that says, in good and in bad, but what we really mean is, I'm married to you as long as it's good. And we fail to say, you know, sometimes God may want us even in the bad. All right. When do the terms of peace become unacceptable? Ah, great question. The terms of peace become unacceptable when they deny my right to existence. You see, Abram was willing to live with what he saw, thought, what they both thought were second best. But what it meant for him was, I'm going to have to work a little bit harder, but I'm willing to do that for peace. And terms become unacceptable. You remember my definition of good? Good is something both of us can live with. And when I don't think, when it's not something I can live with, then it's unacceptable. All right? I can spend 45 minutes on that easily. Why was Abram willing to let Lot choose? Was this a sign of faith? He was willing to let Lot choose. Not only was it a sign of faith, because it violated or it went against the standard. Normally the older one, the uncle, would have been the one to choose. And what he's doing here is, I'm giving my right of first choice up. And so it's a sign of faith, but it's also a sign of how much he loves Lot and he wants Lot to prosper as well okay all right again we're going to continue this next week we're going to find out when conflict is a good thing for those of you that think oh i like a little conflict well don't worry it's coming all right brother dan